Hi, thank you for coming to my talk. In this talk, we will look at functors and how to use them in Python programs. Don't worry if you haven't heard of functors before. This talk requires no prior knowledge of functors or category theory. The talk is for Python programmers and is, and is designed for ease of understanding. There will be places where we will choose to simplify things at the expense of skipping some math details. The code examples are based on an open source Python package called Funklift. The links to the GitHub repositories of Funklift and its tutorials are shown on the slide. Before we move on to the meat of the talk, a quick introduction of myself. My name is Char Wu. I'm a software developer, grew up in Taiwan and I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area for the past 20 years. Now, today's agenda is very simple. We will start with a motivating example, and then we will introduce various functors with even more examples. Let's start with a simple function, getPrice, that takes an item and returns the item's price. To visualize the code, we can draw types as dots and functions as arrows. As you can see, item is a dot in the diagram, and int is also a dot. GetPrice is an arrow that goes from item to int. Now we have another function, is pricey, and we can draw it as an arrow as well. This time, the arrow goes from int to bool. With those two functions, what interesting things can we do with them? Well we can compose the two functions to form a new function. Notice that the composition of functions in code corresponds nicely to the composition of arrows in our diagram. A diagram like the one we are seeing here represents a category in category theory. Essentially, a category consists of dots and arrows plus some properties about how arrows compose. We will call our category here the, cat the category of types. In this category, the dots are Python types and the arrows are Python functions. Now let's see, uh, let's move on to see how functors are related to categories. Here we have a function is even that goes from in to bool. And we have a list of numbers one, two, three, four. We want to map is even over the numbers. One way to achieve that is by using this comprehension. Another way is to use the CList class of the functlift package. As you can see from the code here, the CList class has a method called fmap. fmap takes the function is even and maps it over the list of numbers behind the scenes. On the outside, we can think of fmap as lifting is even to a function that goes from C list of int to C list of bool. If we put the is even function and its lifted counterpart side by side, we can see that C list is actually a mapping from a source category to a target category. Such a mapping is called a functor if it satisfies certain properties. In our case, CList is a functor. The source category and the target category of CList are both the category of types. A functor is called an endo functor when its source and target categories are the same. Okay, now now that we've introduced the concepts of categories and functors, let's see some functors in action. And let's see also see what problems they solve. It's common to have code that performs some kind of input or output. For example, we might have code that sends a request over a network, reads a file, or writes a record to a database. Such IO actions 
are side effects that make our code harder to reason about because they break referential transparency. Here on the side, the function get number side effect on the left has side effects because it reads user input from a console. To avoid such side effect, we can wrap the IO action into an instance of the IO class. With that, when we call the get number function on the right, no actual reading from the console will take place. Rather, we simply get an IO object that represents the IO action. The code here shows what we can do with the IO object returned by the get number function. Even though no actual IO has happened yet when we call get number, that does not stop us from mapping the isEven function over the non existent number. Eventually, when we are finally ready to incur the actual I.O., we would do so by calling the unsafe run method on the I.O. object. Although our example here is simple, already it shows that with the I.O. functor, we are able to keep the kernel of our code free of side effects and push the actual I.O. actions to the boundary of our program. Now let's look at another example. Here at the top, we have a function that takes an integer and returns 10 modulo that integer. The function is a partial function because it's not defined when the input integer is zero. To fix that, we can write the function at the bottom. The function at the bottom is now defined for all input values. However, we now have a different issue. And that is, the new function is not very composable with other functions. Here's an illustration of the lack of composability. As you can see, the code on the right tries to compose the two functions on the left. Because the 10 mod by function returns either an integer or none, it is not very composable. And we have to use if else statements when we try to compose it with other functions. Is there a solution that can turn a, fun a partial function into a total function while retaining composability? Yes, that solution is the option functor. As the example here shows, the 10 mod by function now returns an option of int. The option class of the functlift package has a subclass called nothing and another subclass called sum. Nothing represents the absence of a value. On the other hand, sum represents the existence of a value. By the magic of functors and their fmap methods, we can compose 10 map by with other functions without any if-else statements in the code. Just like how we visualize CList as a functor, we can visualize Option as a functor. The functor maps dots and arrows from a source category to a target category. So far, we've been composing functions. It turns out that we can compose functors too. This diagram shows that we can compose the option functor and the CList functor. The result of the composition is a new functor, and we call that new functor CList after option. Like any other functor, the new functor is a mapping between two categories. It maps dots to dots and arrows to arrows. If we can compose functors the way we compose arrows, does that mean functors are arrows in some sort of category? Notice that in this diagram, each rectangle represents a category. If we collapse the rectangles into dots, 
we will get a category whose dots are smaller categories and whose arrows are functors. Here's what that category looks like in a diagram. We call it the category of small categories. Of course, we don't just look at theories. We want to see some code, right? Absolutely. The code example on this side shows how to compose functors in Python. Here, the variable nums is a C list of option objects. If we call fmap on nums, we will not be able to map over the numbers inside the option objects. In order to do that, we need to compose the two functors first to form a new functor. And we do that by using the compose class of the functlift package. Once we have the composite functor, we can call fmap on it, just like we do with any other functors. This is really fantastic. In this diagram, capital F denotes a functor. The functors we've seen so far are called covariant functors. Here, covariant, covariant basically means that the two vertical arrows in the diagram point in the same direction. In other words, when a functor maps a source arrow to a target arrow, if the mapping does not change the direction of the arrows, then the functor is covariant. On the other hand, if the two vertical arrows in the diagram point in the opposite direction, then the functor is contravariant. For covariant functors, we have the fmap method. For contravariant functors, we have the cmap method. Similar to fmap, the cmap method lifts a function from type A to type B to a function that goes from f of B to f of A. Here's an example of a contravariant functor called predicate. A predicate is something that is either true or false. In our example, we first have a predicate that will be true if we give it an, e an even integer. And as the diagram shows, we can use cmap to convert that predicate of int into a predicate of str. With the converted predicate, we can pass it the number 6 as a string and it will tell us if that's an even number or not. The next type of functors we will look at is called applicative functor. Before we introduce applicative functor, we need to first get to know a special kind of categories called closed category. In the diagram on the side, there are two categories. The category on the left has a dot for type A and a dot for type B. If the category also has a dot in gray for the function type A to B plus some other properties, then the category is called a closed category. An example of a function type is int to bool, as shown in the blue box. Now let's turn our attention to the category on the right. The category has a dot for the type f of a and a dot for the type f of b. Because it's also a closed category, it has a dot for the function type f of a to f of b in green. Between the two categories, we have a functor that maps dots to dots and arrows to arrows. In particular, the functor maps the gray dot a to b on the left to the blue dot f of a to b on the right in blue. Now, it may be the case that the blue dot and the green dot are not related at all. However, if they happen to be one and the same dot, 
Then we say that the functor preserves the structure of the source category, and we call the functor a strict closed functor. Requiring the blue dot and the green dot to be the same dot is a rather strict condition. A somewhat more relaxed condition is to not require the two dots to be the same. Instead, we merely require that there's an arrow between the two dots. In such a case, we call the functor a lax closed functor. Another name for Uh, another name for lax, for lax closed functor is applicative functor. And we call the arrow between the blue dot and the green dot app. That's a lot of theory. Let's see an example in code. Here we have a queried function for summing two integers. Currying means if a function takes multiple arguments, then the queried function will take one argument at a time. In this example, we start with sum of 20. Then we map, we f map the queried function uh, over it. What we end up with is an op option of int to int, which is shown as the blue dot in the diagram. Because our option functor is an applicative functor, we have the app arrow that takes us from the blue dot to the green dot. The green dot is essentially a function that takes an option of int and returns another option of int. So if we give that function sum of 30, we will get back sum of 50 as the result. Next, let's turn our attention to a kind of functors called bifunctors. In Python, if we have a type A and a type C, we can form the tuple type A comma C. Similarly, if we have a type B and a type D, we can form a tuple type B comma D. And if there's an arrow from A to B, and another arrow from C to D, we can take those two arrows and form a tuple of arrows that goes from A comma C to B comma D. Now, if we have a functor that maps A comma C to F of A comma C and B comma D to F of B comma D, and the functor also maps the tuple of arrows to a lifted tuple of arrows, then we call such functor a bifunctor. In Python code, a functor class takes only one type argument, whereas a bifunctor class takes two type arguments. Let's see an example of a bifunctor. The bifunctor in the example is the either class from the functlift package. As its name suggests, either represents one of two possibilities. We represent those two possibilities with two classes, left and right. In the code example, we take two functions, add one and negate, and uh, we bimap them over an either object. Because the either object is a right object, the negate function will have no effect and the add one function will be applied to the number five. Like by functor, there's a kind of functors called profunctor that also takes two type arguments. The difference is a bifunctor is covariant in both of its type arguments, whereas a profunctor is contravariant in the first type argument and covariant in the second type argument. The diagram here is very similar to the diagram we saw earlier for bifunctors. The only difference is that 
the arrow between type A and type B is flipped. Um, a perhaps very helpful way for visualizing how a profunctor works is through a diagram like the one at the bottom. We can visualize a profunctor P of A comma C as a box that takes an A and outputs a C. When we call DIMAP on the profunctor with F and G, we get back a new profunctor that takes a B and outputs a D. There are many different profunctors. One of them is called forget. It always returns some value of type R, no matter what type of input value you give it. Star and costar are two other kinds of profunctors. The symbol F here represents a functor. So star F takes an A and returns an F of C. When you die map on it, you can turn it into a new star F that takes a B and returns an F of D. Here's a cool example of the star profunctor. The star profunctor takes an integer and returns an option of int. If we give it integer 3, it will give us sum of 1 because 10 mod by 3 is 1. If we pass 0 to the profunctor, it will give us nothing because 10 mod by 0 is not a valid operation. We can take the star profunctor and die map on it with the store to int function on the way in and with the is even function on the way out. What we end up with is a new profunctor that takes a string and returns an option of bool. As you can see, the code example we have starts to, uh, starts to look like some sort of data pipelines that can be chained and composed in flexible ways. And that's indeed a good application of profunctors. Congratulations for making it to this point. We've covered a lot in a fairly short amount of time. In summary, we've introduced the concept of categories. Then we covered covariant, contravariant, closed, applicative functors, as well as bifunctors and profunctors. Hope you all enjoyed the talk. Thank you.